This video is on asthma, our last obstructive lung disease. Before we talk about asthma, let's just discuss our normal lung. So let's draw our normal lungs. We said that in your conducting zone, you have a lot of defenses. You have your mucociliary escalator. You also have a lot of cells like neutrophils, we said, play a role, so neutrophils. You also have immune cells, um, especially lymphocytes like Th1. Th1. And when stuff gets in your lungs, then these cells kind of fight them off. Even non-bacterial stuff, even like dust or pollen or all that stuff, you kind of you kind of meet on a day-to-day -day basis. So you can go into your lungs, and these cells fight it off. And sometimes inflammatory responses can cause uh, bronchoconstriction. So let's just draw our our airway. And normally, uh, bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation is mediated by sympathetic and parasympathetic activity. So sympathetic activity, all right, sympathetic, relaxes it, relax. And this is really seen in beta two activity. And it relaxes it by increasing camp, increasing camp. If you wanna constrict it for whatever reason, like if you see inflammatory response, you constrict it via parasympathetic, parasympathetic. And this causes constriction. And this is via muscarinic activity, muscarinic. So let's say you're running on a track with someone and you hit a big dust, a cloud of dust and you inhale it. Well, you can have an inflammatory response to that and you can have bronchoconstriction, don't you get kind of <laughs> chest tightening, hard to, hard to breathe. But after you kind of moved away from that, normally you kind of clear it. So it's not too bad, uh, your body responds to it, but it's, it's nothing out of, out of the ordinary. Yeah, there's nothing too severe about it. So that's just normal lungs. Um, in asthma, however, in asthma, there's a heightened response to that stimuli. There's a heightened response to that stimuli. Okay, and it creates an incredible inflammatory response. Inc cre creates an incredible amount of mucus, creates an incredible amount of bronchospasm, and that bronchospasm and mucus causes the obstruction. That's why we're talking about an obstructive lung disease. Okay, so, all right, asthma. In asthmatic lungs, there's a heightened response. Heightened response. To that stimuli. Um, and spirometry will illustrate this, show all the same signs that as obstructive lung disease, you know, increase residual volume, decrease uh, FEV1, FEC ratio, all that good stuff, hyperinflated lungs on chest ratio, all that stuff. The difference, however, is that uh, asthma is reversible, reversible. So a patient comes in with an asthmatic attack, you do a, you can do a spirometry test and it's like way, is really bad, right? Their FEV1, FEZ is really low, all that stuff. And then you give them some medication, some asthma medication. And they, oh, they can breathe better now. Oh, they can breathe better now. And they can do it, the, spirometry, the spirometry test again. And because it's reversible, the spirometry test will improve, improve. So all right, improve with medication, with med. Now, the best way to test if uh, someone has asthma is you can cause constriction, all right? And in a normal patient, it'll cause a little bit of constriction, but you know, again, there's nothing out of the ordinary, nothing too severe. But in asthma, they have a heightened response, so they can, you can cause a restriction, and it causes so much constriction that their spirometry levels drop, they're having shortness of breath, all that stuff. So we're gonna give them a muscarinic agonist, cause that constriction. And that muscarinic agonist is called methacholine. In particular, it's a muscarinic 3 agonist. So the methacholine test. And if their spirometry levels drop with the methacholine test, then you know, okay, patient has asthma. If it's a negative test, if it's a negative test, that's the best way to rule out asthma. So negative test, rule out asthma. Rule out asthma. So all these are findings that you'll see in asthma, but why do they get these findings? Why do they get this heightened response in the first place? Why do they get this heightened response in the first place? This is, these, this was our normal lung. Let's draw our asthmatic lung. Let's draw our asthmatic lung. Instead of the normal Th1 cells, you have abnormal amounts of Th2 cells. And Th2 cells, you should know, are your helper cells. 
And they release a ton of interleukins that help us differentiate and kind of modulate our immune function. That's why they're helper cells. They release things like interleukin-4 and interleukin-5 and interleukin-10. 4 switches class of B cells into IgE. 5 makes IgA and recruits eosinophils. And then interleukin-10 just makes more Th2. And that kind of revs that cycle up even more. Kind of plays out of control. Okay, um, so that's TH2. The eosinophils release something called major basic protein, which can cause, which is an inflammatory protein, cause inflammation, cause that bronchoconstriction that makes you know our characteristic asthma sign. So, inflammation, bronchoconstriction plus bronchoconstriction. IgE can help cross-link mast cells, as you know. And when it does that, the mast cells degranulate, release histamine, cause inflammation, cause that bronchoconstriction. So inflammation plus bronchoconstriction. That's kind of like the name of the game, right? Bronchoconstriction. And these are kind of immediate. <clears throat> Uh, once they encounter any sort of trigger stimuli, they'll go through this pathway and it's kind of immediate. But if you survive the immediate bronchoconstriction, shortness of breath, wheezing, chest pain, all that stuff, don't think you're out of the woods yet. Because uh, later on, late phase, late phase, anytime you have immune inflammation response, you release our big, big inflammatory mediator. Hopefully you remember from our immune talk, in your cell membrane, in your cell membrane, you have something called arachnidonic acid. And when there's inflammation, you kind of release that arachnidonic acid. Kind of like break glass in case of emergency. You break glass, arachnidonic acid comes out. Okay, and arachnidonic acid gets worked on by five label oxygenase to make leukotrienes. and cyclooxygenase make prostaglandins. All right, that's some basic of uh, immune stuff. Hopefully nothing too out of the blue there. All right, leukotrienes is a big one we're gonna talk about because leukotrienes cause that bronchoconstriction. There, that term is again, late phase in particular. So bronchoconstriction, all right. So leukotrienes can work on your airway and cause that bronchoconstriction. Constriction. So what are some findings you see in asthma? Well, on physical exam, they're gonna have that wheezing, that shortness of breath, chest tightness. Um, but if you want particular findings, chest x-ray, you'll see that hyperinflated lungs because it is an obstructive lung disease. You also see these bronchioles getting thick because of the mucus, because of the constriction. And they call it Peribronchial cuffing, which is a fancy word of saying they're kind of thick. So I'll just write peribronchial cuffing. Kind of looks like a cuff. And if you look on the x ray, there's a great image on my notes. You'll see these little donut shapes from that, from that cuffing. Okay. Microscopically, you'll be able to see some of these mediators. You'll be able to see mucus. Microscopically, you'll be able to see that mucus. All right, mucus. And oftentimes it looks kind of like a spiral. You get these long mucus spirals. We call these Kirschman spirals. Kirschman. Again, another great picture will be my notes. And if that's not enough, you'll be able to see things like major basic protein. All right, major basic protein break down, breaks down and looks kind of crystal shaped. We call these charcoal laden crystals. Charcoal laden crystals. All right. So these are all signs that you see in asthma that they want you to know. Now there's now there's a different type of asthma that you should be aware of. Um, there's a kind of an adult onset type of asthma that's not associated with funky immune cells. That's not associated with increased eosinophils and mast cells and all this stuff. It's just called non-allergic asthma. What a fitting name, non-allergic 
asthma. Sometimes called intrinsic. Intrinsic. And I'll say I've seen more in adults. Seen more in adults. And not related to, like I said, IgE, eosinophils, mast cells, all that stuff. Some triggers of it, however, are things like exercise, especially in cold, cold climates. You might, you might have it. You might go out and try to exercise, try to run, and then you get kind of chest tightness, kind of stuff like that. So exercise is a big one. Um, occupational exposures, viruses can cause that chest tightening. Um, aspirin is a big one. Aspirin, they really want you to know. All right, so adult taking aspirin starts to develop chest tightness, <clears throat> shortness of breath, all that stuff. Why? Did he get it from that? Because aspirin blocks cyclooxygenase, right? And that kind of shunts things into the leukotriene pathway. And you get bronchoconstriction. Aspirin gets, gets you all those signs and it also gives you nasal polyps. Nasal polyps. We talked about something that gave you nasal polyps earlier in our previous video. Do you remember what that was? That was CF, cystic fibrosis. So if you see uh, nasal polyps in a kid that has malabsorption, failure to thrive, chronic lung infections, you're thinking more of CF. If you see someone, uh, adult with nasal polyps who's taking aspirin, you're thinking non-allergic asthma or intrinsic asthma, okay? I think that's all I wanna talk about on that. Let's talk about some pharmacology. Asthma, pharmacology, everybody's favorite topic. Asthma, pharmacology. And anytime I talk about pharmacology, I always like to draw out the pathway. The pathway, the pathophysiology, and you have the pathophysiology here, right? You have immune cells causing inflammation, causing bronchoconstriction. I kind of erased it, but let's draw out what causes our bronchoconstriction and our bronchorelaxation. We said that you're sympathetic. Sympathetic relaxes, relaxes via beta 2. Yeah, and it does that by increasing camp does that by increasing camp. We say your parasympathetic constricts via muscarinic, via muscarinic activity. So you have your entire pathway of asthma. And when you have your entire pathway of asthma, it makes um, asthma pharmacology really, really easy. We'll just go down the list. We'll just go down the list and try and knock these steps out. Try and block these steps, try and reduce our symptom of asthma. So, the first one we can do, we can block IgE. Let me use a different color so it's not all the same. We can block IgE. Block IgE. With something called amalizumab. This is a monoclonal antibody against IgE. Amalizumab. So, all right, MAB against IgE. Let's work our way down. If we can't block IgE, we know that IgE will work on our mast cells. Well, we can try and stop our mast cells from degranulating. We can stabilize our mast cells with something called chromalin. Chromalin. So chromalin stabilizes mast cells. All right, stabilize. And if we can't work on that, <laughs> we'll just move on our way down. So we said a big one is our arachnidonic acid, breaking in the leukotrienes, right? Uh, the biggest thing that works on this pathway is corticosteroids. Hopefully remember, so corticosteroids, corticos. And we don't wanna give systemic corticosteroids. I mean, this is only affecting our lungs. We don't wanna give systemic corticosteroids that affects everything else. So we give inhaled corticos, and that's good. It goes right to our lungs, kind of reduces the side effect of all the systemic, all the systemic um, effects of corticosteroids. You can still get localized effects. For example, it can cause localized immunodeficiency so you can get things like candida in your mouth so make sure you rinse so all right candida of the mouth candida of the mouth so a question i actually got a question on that someone was taking that for um, asthma corticosteroids for asthma and getting, was getting candida and they asked how could you reduce this just ask, just ask them to rinse their mouth all right rinse their mouth out So that's that. And then we said arachnidonic acid gets worked on by 5 lipooxygenase to make leukotrienes. We can block 5 lipooxygenase. So we're just literally just going down the line. We can block this with something called xylutin. 
and it blocks that 5 lipo oxygenase. If we can't do it, let's just move on down the line. We said it makes uh, leukotrienes, and leukotrienes work on here, work on here, and cause that bronchoconstriction. We don't want that. In fact, it works on a receptor called CIS-LT1 receptor. We can block this activation. By blocking that receptor, we kind of limit its effect. So we'll give something called leukotriene receptor antagonist. Receptor antagonist. And by blocking the receptor that it works on, then doesn't elicit its effect. Um, all drugs, all of these drugs end in leucast. Leucast. So things like um, Monte Leucast. You see Leucast, you're thinking of Leucotrine, Leucotrine receptor antagonist. Okay? And then we're at our final spot. Our final spot. You, we said normally your airways relax via beta 2 due to increased CAM. We say it normally constricts via muscarinic. So if we want to kind of maximize our airways, we'll want to really, really relax it and kind of block our constriction. And that way we get a nice big airway. And so if we want to relax it, we're going to want to give beta 2 agonist. If we want to stop the constriction, we're going to give muscarinic antagonist. Yeah, stop that constriction. So that's exactly what we do. We give beta 2 agonist. Beta 2 agonist. Beta 2 agonist. You should know that the short acting ones, short acting, include things like albuterol. Anything that has the word albuterol in it. There's one called Lev Albuterol, and that's also short acting. So if it has the word albuterol in it, it's short acting. So what are long acting? Anything that doesn't have albuterol in it. So short acting is albuterol. Um, some side effects include tachycardia, because sometimes they're not only specific to beta 2, sometimes they work on beta 1 receptors in the heart, so it can cause tachycardia. So short acting, albuterol, I think that's all I want to talk about for that one. And then we said we want to block constriction. We want to give muscarinic antagonist. Block this. That's exactly what we do. Muscarinic antagonist. And these all end in tropium. Tropium. With an M on the end. So it makes it easy to remember. M for muscarinic antagonist. The short acting one is called ipratropium. That is a short acting one. Uh, so we have all the drugs listed, boom, 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 boom. Uh, you might be asking, well, which one's first line? You know, what do we use in acute settings? What do we use in chronic settings? Acute settings, we give beta agonists, or the shortest acting, we just give it to them. <clears throat> For um, mild asthma, we can give beta agonists, we can throw in a long-acting corticosteroid to kind of, kind of give a chronic control of their asthma. And if that doesn't control, we just start adding, we just start adding drugs. We start adding muscarinic antagonists, we start adding like, Xylutins and stuff, just one by one, okay? Okay, um, there's one more drug, there's one more drug that we haven't talked about, kind of an odd one out. It doesn't really fit into our normal pathway, so it's kind of the odd one out. And this goes under the category of methyl xanthines. Xanthines, and the drug is called theophylline. Well, how does it work? It increases uh, bronchodilation by increasing CAM, increasing CAM. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. How does it do that particularly? Well, it can block phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase breaks down CAMP. So if you block it, you increase CAMP. You might re recognize this because that's what drugs like Viagra do. All right. They also block phosphodiesterase, also increase CAMP, and that causes dilation, vasodilation in that case. And another pathway is that there's a transmitter called adenosine, adenosine, and adenosine decreases CAMP. Well, we don't want that. So this is an adenosine, adenosine antagonist. And by blocking that, we can increase CAMP. So you can increase CAMP in two different ways. Didn't really fit, fit in with our uh, pathway, so I kind of excluded it. Hope you'll forgive me. And I hope that explains asthma, pharmacology, and that actually does it for obstructive lung diseases. Uh, in our next video, we'll talk about restrictive lung diseases. Until then, thanks.